As I mentioned in the previous episode, in 1750, the 13 colonies were not yet fully formed, but their population stood at 1.5 million, so they were becoming a heavyweight compared to the other North American territories. While 90% of them lived as farmers, some large cities like Philadelphia, New York, and Boston also existed, and they offered the chance to live a different life. Settlers started migrating westwards, provoking conflicts with the natives, which the British government tried to avoid for fear of losing control over the colonies. Tensions between the colonists and the mother country were rising, but first another enemy had to be dealt with. Further administrative changes were coming. For example, Georgia became a crown colony two years later. Economic output grew, and while the colonies were restricted in trading with other European powers, they did trade with other British territories, like the Caribbean islands, selling tobacco, lumber, fur and foodstuffs for tea, coffee and sugar. Their own shipbuilding industry was established, but certain colonies became heavily reliant on slave labor, particularly in the south, where these slaves worked on vast plantations. Besides the English, immigrants from other European lands arrived, mainly from Ireland and Protestant provinces in Germany, leading to the Great Awakening, a Christian revival movement which united evangelicals across various denominations, but also divided existing churches. Back in 1738, an incident provoked war with Spain. It successfully defended its colonies, and while the French town of Louisbourg was captured, the peace treaty restored the status quo, so it had to be returned, which angered the colonists. After that, both France and Britain wanted to expand towards the Ohio River Valley, which soon provoked another conflict, the French and Indian War. It sparked a major European war between the great powers, and while it's known as the Seven Years' War, many historians regard it as the First World War, as it was fought on several continents at the same time. Since there were only 75,000 French settlers in the region, the British outnumbered them 20 to 1. They mainly settled the St. Lawrence River Valley and traded with the natives, often marrying their daughters. As the map shows, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Valley were nominally under French rule, but vast areas were uninhabited or dominated by native tribes, even in Nova Scotia and Maine, where Micmacs and Abenakis lived. The Iroquois Confederation ruled upstate New York and Ohio country. They were initially neutral. In the Great Lakes region, Hurons and other tribes dwelt. The French recruited warriors among them to fight against the British. In the southeast, the Cherokee first sided with the British, then turned against them to fight their own war. Down south, the Spanish ruled Florida, but there were only a few hundred Europeans there in St. Augustine. The French had no European regular forces, only about 3,000 colonial troops, while the British had a small regular force and a much larger militia. When the French started building forts in Ohio country, Virginia sent a young George Washington there to demand their immediate withdrawal, which did not happen. After small skirmishes, in which dozens died, both France and Britain sent more forces from Europe, while the British harassed French shipping throughout 1755. Seven of the British colonies sent representatives to the Albany Congress to discuss a treaty with the Mohawk tribe and defensive measures against the French, and while the plan to unite the colonies failed, the format of the Congress became the basis for future assemblies that played an important role in the War of Independence. The first British expedition to capture a French fort was a disaster. It was ambushed by French and native forces. 1,000 soldiers were killed, along with General Braddock. The remaining survivors were then led back by George Washington and Thomas Gage. Back in Britain, William Pitt the Elder, who later became Prime Minister, decided that a serious effort was needed to strengthen their positions in North America. In 1756, several acts were passed, 
allowing increased recruitment and the capture of ships by privateers. British forts were reinforced, a new expedition was sent north, but the subsequent battle was indecisive, although in the meantime, Colonel Moncton captured Fort Beauséjour in Nova Scotia, cutting off Louisbourg. After that, the deportation of the French-speaking Acadian population began, making sure no help could be provided to this important town. French reinforcements arrived in May with Major General Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, an experienced leader, just when Britain formally declared war on France. British forts near Lake Ontario were destroyed, native warriors launched raids on frontier settlements, so a wave of refugees started moving east. Montcalm took Fort Oswego, his opponent, John Campbell, sailed to Louisbourg to take it, but he faced a larger French fleet, so he returned to New York. In August 1757, Montcalm achieved another victory at Fort William Henry, where the British garrison surrendered in return for free passage, but they were then massacred by Montcalm's Indian allies, who wanted revenge and the loot. Despite these victories, New France faced more difficulties in 1758. The British blockade prevented the departure of more French reinforcements, a poor harvest and the harsh winter exacerbated the situation, not to mention the outbreak of smallpox among the natives, which forced them to cease trading for the moment. General John Forbes and his expedition captured Ohio River Valley and Fort Duquesne without a fight and renamed it Fort Pitt. Louisbourg in Nova Scotia was taken after a siege, but the French were once again victorious in the Battle of Carillon, or Ticonderoga, against a much larger British force. General Geoffrey Amherst then became commander-in-chief of all British forces, and while France focused on the invasion of Britain, which failed, he received supplies for the next campaign. In 1759, Ticonderoga and Fort Niagara were captured, followed by Quebec City, as the French were defeated in the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, where both Montcalm and Major General Wolfe died. The next year, an initially successful French counterattack was stopped, Quebec was kept by the British, who then proceeded to Montreal, which was surrounded and taken in September. With that, most of the fighting was done, although the French surprisingly took St. John in 1762, but it was soon recovered by a larger British force. The next year, a peace treaty was finally signed, according to which New France was taken by Britain, France kept its Caribbean islands and two small settlements, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, while Spain ceded Florida to the British, but gained Louisiana from France in return. Quebec was thus conquered, the British no longer had to fear another French invasion, but this also made the colonies feel that they no longer needed the protection of the crown. Ohio country was now available for settlement, so the colonists kept moving westwards, which provoked another war, this time against a loose coalition of native tribes. In that same year, alarmed by General Amherst's policies, Pontiac's rebellion resulted in the destruction of several forts, but the natives were unable to drive away the settlers and the British army, so peace negotiations started the next year. Both sides committed horrible atrocities, relations with the natives sank to a new low, but King George III issued a royal proclamation in which he outlined the administration of the newly conquered territory. It forbade all settlements west of the Appalachian Mountains, which angered the colonists, but at the same time, a border dispute between Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware also had to be settled. Thanks to the painstaking work of Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, a new demarcation line, the Mason-Dixon Line, was created to separate four states, but its east-west portion later became the informal line separating southern slave states and northern free states. This was still far into the future, though, so I will stop here in 1768, 
with British domination on the North American continent, which was not to last. In the next episode, I will discuss the war for independence. Until then, see you around.